into it. Um, so I guess would, so I'll just kick it off with a, with a, a prayer and then I'll offer just a brief introduction to Mike and, and Alicia, who unfortunately can't be here due to death in the family. Um, and uh, uh, we'll be keeping you all in prayer too. And then if you can offer, you know, maybe 15, 20 minutes about your, your journey, maybe some of the things you've learned along the way, some of the work that you do and any advice you have for the um, emerging entrepreneurs here. And, um, and then we can have some Q&A for maybe 30 minutes or so. so awesome. Just take a moment of, of silence as we begin our day or in the middle of our day, depending on our time zone. Call that the Lord is with us. In the, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we humbly implore that you send your Holy Spirit upon this time together, this group, that uh, we may gain insights into our vocations uh, through our work, through family, um, as you call us ever deeper into love. I ask you to anoint Mike's words and thoughts that he may have the clarity and 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 wisdom in you to, to help guide this discussion for, for fruitfulness. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Again, thank you, Mike, for, for being here um, with the finalists. Uh, and just offer, offer a little introduction, um, introduction to you, uh, some notes I've written down. Uh, so Mike and Alicia founded the Messy Family Project, uh, and I'm sure you know, I'll tell you more about that, but online ministry uh, encouraging and empowering parents uh, to build up vibrant Catholic families. Uh, and they have a podcast, they've got a blog, um, other resources that they've developed. And uh, I think now you have over 10,000 families that uh, listen every month. And um, the OSV has also been a partner for you in this. So there's a, re a relationship there. Um, and so you've, you've, you know, built a little, built a, built a ministry, you know, all that goes with that, you know, the fundraising and the marketing and the communications and the team and the things that don't work and the things that do. And yeah. um, so it's just to end at the same time, raising 10 kids. And, um, you know, so I think it'd be very it's great to learn from you in terms of how, how you've gone about this entrepreneurial journey, but especially integrating being a, you know, being a family person yourself. So thank you, Mike, for, for being here again. Yes, and and um, you are getting the worst half. You know, my wife isn't here. Um, she, we uh, it was kind of a last minute thing, um, so I'm sorry she can't be with us. But uh, do ask you to keep her uh, her uncle who just passed away this morning in your prayers. Uh, she went down to help uh, as he was in the hospital, um, and it took a turn for the worse. And uh, and but we had a beautiful beautiful time together actually. Um, uh, praying, you know, kind of virtually on Zoom uh, last night with all the extended family with him uh, in his final hours. Um, and I, I think that, it, so So forgive me, I might be a little um, disconnected, uh, but but the um, uh, coming to the final things, it really takes a, a gives you a perspective, right? It, it reminds you of, of who you are and where you're going. And um, although I've, I've helped uh, or been a part of launching a, um, a couple different uh, organizations and efforts. Um, I, I think it really does come back to, and I'm, I'm obviously um, biased in this, but I think it all comes back to the family. Um, I believe entrepreneurs, innovators, uh, we have this desire to change the world in some way, to, to recognize that there is something new and powerful that's needed. And I look out at our world today um, and I see, you know, whether it be, um, you know, the racism and the, the riots, whether you see just the, the challenges in, in so many different places within the world and the church, um, uh, the world needs renewal, the world needs transformation. Um, and I, um, I spent about 10 years in, in politics and was given this, um, this quote uh, from St. Ignatius of Loyola. And he said, uh, the devil will use that which is far off to distract us from that which is near, uh, the things that we can control. Sometimes we get so caught up in the big things uh, in our world, the socioeconomic, political issues, uh, as I was kind of, uh, as I worked in politics, um, but I lost sight maybe, or we sometimes lose sight of the things that are right in front of us. And, and the thing that can have the greatest impact, I believe in the transformation of our world um, is our family. Uh, it is through our marriage and family 
that we can and we will transform the world. Uh, it, it's part of God's divine economy. You know, it was five smooth stones uh, that, that took down a giant. It was uh, 300 in, in an army uh, for, for Gideon uh, that, that took on this, these thousands. Uh, and it was one simple yes of Our Lady that began um, our salvation. And I believe it's in these small, uh, simple things, the things that we can do that really have this big power. Um, and I believe that if, if we looked at um, the thing that we have the greatest control over, even more than our, our business or our apostolate or our evangelization efforts, it's our marriage and it's our family. And uh, the church always talks about how the family is the, is the building block of society, right? It's the most important social entity. Um, and I believe that this is the path that we can transform the world through. Um, we really strongly believe, my wife and I believe that this is the age of the family. You know, they're, they're in the past, God would use diff, raise up different religious communities to respond to uh, heresies or challenges or issues in the world to serve. And, you know, uh, the, 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 so many different communities that have done so many beautiful things in educating and serving the poor and the hospitalized and dealing with the, the you know, like the Jesuits dealing with some of the errors uh, coming out of, of the Reformation and so forth. But I believe that it is, a, uh, it is a time like this that the family has been perfectly suited, perfectly fit uh, to renew our world. And whether you see it from the um, uh, Vatican II calling on the, the laity to take our place, the universal call to holiness, or whether it's John Paul II's theology of the body, or so many things that are really uh, speaking to this. And our world, uh, you know, the, the, there are so many things that are, are trying to challenge and undermine the family. I believe that the, even if they don't know it fully, they know that the family is the, the one key that can really foil all the plans uh, of, of evil and destruction and, 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 uh, of this world. And um, there's actually this great uh, social science research that goes into and says, where did we lose the faith? And uh, it, it points to social science research, points to the fact that first the family broke down um, and then there was a loss of faith. And we believe, again, the, the exact opposite is also true, meaning that if you restore and rebuild the family, you will also be restoring and renewing the faith. Uh, because it is within that context, within that family, that we all individually learn uh, who is a father, who is a mother, where do I belong, who am I, and where am I going? Um, and so if we, we really want to, I guess this is our first kind of uh, thesis, if you will, and really the impetus of our mission is that if we want to uh, renew the church and transform the world, we need to strengthen and renew family life. Um, this is, I believe, the, the call of our day. And I also think it's, you know, some people look and say, well, you know, breakdown of the family is the problem. No, we believe that restoring the family is the solution. And the more that we can do that, uh, the more our world will be, uh, be stronger and richer and more prosperous and more um, fully alive uh, than ever before. Um, and so what is the family? Uh, the family is the first community. And, and I really think that if we, if we kind of break it down, there's probably many ways to do that, but, but we all come from a family. And I believe, you know, we're all gonna end in a family. Um, the family was designed to establish uh, belonging. I, there's three things, establish belonging and confer identity and mission on its members. Um, and, you know, the, the belonging, the answer to questions like, you know, deep, deep, deep questions. Do I have worth? Am I lovable? Am I good? You know, this is what the family does, right? It creates this sense of belonging, but it also talks about identity and mission, you know, um, answering questions of, of who am I? What am I to do? Where am I uh, to go? What, what am I all about? Is there something I'm supposed to do in this world? These, these three, I believe, kind of foundational elements of family are really uh, at the root of uh, God's plan, of why this little unit, this simple thing that sometimes gets overlooked and even made fun of uh, in our world, this is where we find a deep sense of belonging, identity, and mission. You know, um, you know, um, in in uh, uh, is it uh, uh, Victor Frankl's? You know, man's search for meaning. He saw how um, people survived the concentration camps. He could tell who was going to survive and not survive, not simply based on their physical strength, but did they have a purpose? Did they have a sense of where they were going and, and, and what they were all about and who, who were they. And that's really what the mission of the family is. Now, 
Maybe you're like me and you didn't have that experience in your own, your family of origin. Um, but that is what God designed. That's what God hopes and wishes for all individuals. And um, this is the power um, that God wants to use the family for every individual. The, the full flourishing um, of the individual happens um, sometimes um, outside of, but, but be, it's intended to be through, excuse me, uh, through the mission of the family. Um, and, and, and speaking to you specifically as entrepreneurs, speaking to you as innovators, speaking to you as people who look to, uh, to create, I, I hope you realize and hope you found that the work you're about isn't merely a good thing. It's, it's not just an interesting or fun thing, although hopefully it is, uh, but that it actually is calling forth from you, your mission. Uh, your calling, your way of serving, right? And what is a, a vocation but a gift of self? Taking your gifts, your talents, and, and bring them to service of others. It isn't um, assuming you're on this call, uh, you're receiving uh, probably much more than just simply uh, financial assistance. You're receiving um, life from the ways that you're giving yourself away. Um, but our world will benefit as you give yourself away. And um, when I think about the fact that our world is in such need of people who are willing to risk, risk for really uh, putting out their ideas and putting the hard work and the energy and the time and using their gifts well is, is so, so important. Um, but it also comes from who we are. And it's calling us out to mission. And it makes us think about, um, you know, how on our wedding days, right? Um, husband and wives exchange values, exchange promises, and the church blesses this. But this was the day that the family began. This is a day that um, in your marriage, you took on a new identity. Um, you realized that your life was no longer your own. And um, that is a shift, meaning like... Um, you were conferred a new identity. Prior to that, you may have tried different things. Well, maybe I'm an artist, or maybe I'm a musician, or maybe I'm this, or maybe I'm that. But those ultimately aren't uh, kind of a core identity. You know, it was in your wedding day that you actually were conferred a new identity. And much like Abraham, before he was called by God, was called Abram, uh, he was called out. So were you. You were kind of given a new name. Maybe if you, you took on your spouse's last name. But, um, but most importantly, you took on the identity that you are now a husband and wife. And sometimes we see that more clearly when we have children and how um, in having those children, we become a mom and a dad. It is, I found marriage to be, you know, a perfect, perfect, natural, organic progression, but it was in having kids that I experienced a little bit more challenge, right? And one of the reasons we call our mission or our organization, the Messy Family Project is because we've had 10 kids and there is no perfect way, but it is in, in the mess of our lives that God has come to us and he's challenged us and he's called us out of our, ourselves. And really that's what, what vocation really is, right? It is a... Uh, it is a, a knowing who we are so that we can give ourselves away. And it is really in that gift that I found out how um, I was really an um, ang angry person in a way that I didn't fully appreciate until I had teenagers. Uh, I don't know if anyone's had teenagers um, or, or you've got a great ride ahead of you with, with teenagers on the way. But it was for me um, at a moment where I realized that um, God uh, was going to challenge me to be the saint be the man that he wanted me to be. Um, I remember this one moment um, where uh, I, I woke up uh, in the middle of the night and I don't know why, but I, I, um, I got up and uh, I went and checked on all the kids, uh, checked on their beds to see, it was like one o'clock in the morning and you know, see if any little kids fell out of bed. And my one daughter, my teenage daughter, who I've been having some challenges with, uh, she wasn't, wasn't there in her bed. And um, I had our, um, you know, uh, GPS tracking on the phone. I could pull up and see where she was. And she wasn't where she was supposed to be. She, she wasn't at the chapel praying or anything like that. And I just texted her and I said, come home now. Now, if I could put flaming texts or all caps did not express sufficiently how angry I was. And if she walked in that door right that moment, I would have probably unleashed upon her. Um, but because uh, I, I was angry, I was upset, I felt betrayed because we had talked about stuff like this before, but it was also um, a fear. You know, I, I, I'm, I was a teenager too, and nothing good happens after midnight. I was afraid for my daughter. 
And um, when she came back in the door, um, I, 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 I'm glad that I had a, a brief moment right before then to just pray. I said, God, give me wisdom and strength. And there was a peace, a, a peace that didn't come from me, a peace that came um, from God and only from God. And I knew exactly what I needed to say. And I just said, honey, are you okay? Are you all right? And she said, yes, dad, I'm fine. And she tried to explain, you know, and ex make excuses and do all these different things. And I just said, honey, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it in the morning, but you're okay. As long as you're okay, we'll just talk about this in the morning. Well, I went to bed. I don't think she slept very well that night, but the next morning, the conversation was very different. She was no longer defensive and trying to, you know, uh, protect herself and, and make up excuses. She was really convicted. And I, I had the poison of my anger removed. I could see with clarity and I had a great conversation. There were still consequences to her actions, but it was the beginning of a new pathway in our, our relationship. And I believe God used that not simply just to parent my child, but also to change me. I realized that I was being asked to do something that was beyond my ability to be a parent, to lead this family. And I couldn't do it without God. And I feel like that's what the beauty of, of being a, a husband and wife and a, and a mom and a dad is, is that we are being challenged not only to form an individual, not only to, to help and shape them and create a culture within our home, but God has made us a parent, a mom and a dad to change us into the people that God has meant us to be. And it is in those moments of our greatest weakness that God can be strong. And as we step into this, this great and wonderful adventure, um, you know, but whether it be in your, um, the innovations that you're doing for the greater service of the church and the kingdom, um, I think it's important that we recognize that our family is a, a part of this adventure. When we stepped out to do the Messy Family Project, I, we sat down all our kids and said, hey, this is something that we, mom and I, feel convicted and called into, but this is also going to mean challenges uh, for all of you. And particularly because we're in family ministry, we knew that there would be attacks and there would be challenges. And our marriage has had uh, plenty of rocky, uh, pa rocky uh, moments in the last two, two and a half years, really, of, of doing this full time. Um, but it is, it is how we're refined and how our relationships grow. And, um, and our kids bought into the idea and they've seen some of the sacrifices they have had to make. And we need to recognize that uh, because it's, it's, it's part of God's path that we know first and foremost who uh, we are. And our identity first is as a son and daughter of God, second as a husband and wife, and third as a father and a husband or father and a, a mother. And, um, and then it is as leaders of a ministry. When we get those, that priority off, uh, we, we fail. Um, uh, and I'm just going to share one other thing in, in closing here. And this is a scripture passage. Uh, it was in a daily reading maybe a month ago. It was a story, um, an Old Testament story of King Ahab and the prophet Elijah. Now, now, not to be confused with Captain Ahab, right? right? This is King Ahab, the king of Israel, right? So he was a murderer, a thief. Uh, he did all these wicked things as the king stole land and so forth. And Elijah the prophet came down and rebuked him and said, God has, has brought judgment up, down upon you for the, the evil that you have done and you will die and so will your whole household. It, it, I think this may have been the first excommunication, you know, the, coming down a, a prophet condemning um, a leader and, but it had its effect. And the effect was that King Ahab, uh, you know, put on sackcloth and ashes, fasted and prayed and asked for forgiveness. Well, Elijah came down and said, hey, God heard your prayer and he actually has forgiven you. But because of you, your family will die. You, your descendants will be cut off and stricken. And I read that and I thought, what the heck? I, is, this, is this just a, an Old Testament God that, you know, that, is, that is disconnected from the New Testament? How is that forgiving? How is that that the sins of the father will be passed on to the sins of the, 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 his descendants, his children? Th these are innocent, Right. And the more that I, I prayed on it, I, I've realized that um, it wasn't enough that Ahab, as a king and as a father, uh, repented for himself. That, 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 that judgment helped him convert, helped him repent. Um, but he needed to also pass that on and teach his children how to walk with righteousness, how to live and call upon God's mercy in their lives. And he failed to do that. 
And so they weren't requited because of his sins. It was because he never taught them, formed them, and shaped them how to live and repent in that kind of lifestyle. And, and I have to say, my dad was an alcoholic. And um, there was damage done in our household and growing up. Uh, but my dad repented. He became sober. and He's been sober for 30 years. But he didn't teach that to me and to my brothers. And we started down a similar path. And um, it wasn't until I woke up to the path I was heading on and I had to make my own decision that I was going to get back on the straight and narrow path, that I was going to move and I was going to take ownership for my own life and not look as a victim and say, well, this is what my, uh, I'm following the same footsteps and, and I'm just, what, what can be expected of me? But that, that's not sufficient. I needed to live a life that not only for myself, but also for my children, that they knew um, how to live rightly, how to seek mercy, um, and, and how to walk humbly with our God. And this is the path, I believe, that our, um, you know, as we look at our own lives, um, that we need to embrace this challenge that um, we have been given many gifts and many maybe uh, challenges in our lives, but integrating that into who we are and, and, and sharing that with our children as, as we, whether it be the, uh, the challenges like me, I had a, a father who I now have a great relationship with, but that has changed me, has made me into a different dad because of that. Um, you have, as, as husbands and wives, mothers and fathers, um, have different experiences, but also different gifts. And I believe that also in, in the negative way, also in the positive way, in the sense that we are given as innovators some beautiful things that we are supposed to share with the church. And I believe those gifts are meant not only for the church, but also for how you father and mother and how you are husband and wife to each other. That those gifts that you're sharing as innovators is also meant to be shared with your family, to enliven how you father and mother uh, your children, how you are a parent. Uh, because it's, it's in these actions, in our witness, in our words, and in the culture that we breathe within our home is how we're going to be conferring a new mission, identity, and a sense of belonging for our kids. Uh, this is what I believe we are called to um, as, as individuals and as parents and as spouses. But also I think there's something unique and powerful about us as innovators uh, that, that we are called to something even higher uh, to really you know, participate. Uh, in the creative work of God. And that happens both outside in our, our apostolates and our business ventures, but also within the home. So that, that's, uh, that's a mighty calling, but I believe it is something that is powerful and hopefully will be transformative uh, for you and for your children. So God bless you. Well, thank you, Mike, for that. Uh, yeah, that um, beautiful reflection and, and, um, and yeah, just so many insights in there on, on many levels around the family, around your, around your journey and uh, practical advice too. And um, I can, I can, uh, you, you present so well, I can hear your, your work in politics breathing through you. <laughs> just, you there's a great composure and, and uh, persuasiveness to your, and confidence in the way you deliver. So I, I just really, I appreciate that a lot. And I think others do here too. We want to draw some questions in the, in the, let, let you interact with some of the finalists yeah. and some, some questions here. So Nancy, um, I don't know if you, you might probably know each other, but Nancy, if you want to just introduce yourself, some of the work you do, and then I think you had a couple questions for, for Mike. Sure. Hi, I'm Nancy. This is my Hi husband. Bill. Our camera's not getting him all the way in. Um, so we're from Catholic Sprouts, and we have a ministry that was started for children. We have a daily podcast for Catholic kids, but we've since realized, of course, that it's not our duty to get kids to heaven, it's parents. So we um, we were just realizing we really are a ministry for parents. And so, um, so two questions. So first of all, we entered this competition pre-COVID, and then of course COVID happened, and I feel like we're all still trying to understand what that all means. So um, you know, we've surveyed our list, and we have lots of ideas, um, especially since now all of a sudden most parents will be through force, the primary faith educators of their children. If Whether they like it or not. <laughs> they like it or not. So I guess I just, you know, as both a parent and someone that works in ministry for Catholic parents, I'm just kind of wondering like what you see as you look into the future in a COVID world of both like the fruits and not fruits of this whole experience. 
Yeah, I, I, um, I think, and, and you, you probably have seen this as well, but, but as I see it, our ministry was poised because we were, um, we were virtual, uh, much like you, right? Um, that we had um, some in-person events, but the majority of our work was virtual. Um, and I think that is powerful, uh, that we, we have felt more busy than we've ever been in our entire time doing this work. Um, we had more events that we were invited to, virtual events, um, but also just for our own people, there was just a hunger and a longing to figure out how do we do this. So we dedicated podcasts to being the first educators and being the first, uh, the, the, the spiritual leaders, first evangelizers of our children. We've always had that role as parents, but now um, that that has been, um, the ante has been upped for us. And, uh, and, and the support systems, right, that, that all these families knew, the schools, the parishes, and, and so forth, were no longer there to help them. And um, I, I think there is going to be a lot of beautiful fruits. Um, you know, first, probably some COVID kids, right, or quarantine babies, right, <laughs> through this. But I think that there's going to be a deeper uh, appreciation um, for the ways that parents are supported in the schools. Uh, and in the parishes, or at least hopefully that's the case, or their desire to have more. Um, my wife uh, has really been homeschooling up until this year for almost 20 years. And we've always had kids in school and so forth as well. Uh, but this is the first year that we said, okay, everyone's in school. And then this happened. So, you know, this is, this is a unplanned uh, homeschooling uh, situation for us. And it was a real challenge, especially working from home. Um, I, I think there is a... Um, uh, a, a deeper sense that that family matters and that there have been some beautiful moments, at least from, from our listeners, uh, occasions where they're having more fun together because they didn't have to shuttle around uh, their kids, that their kids were home with them. Sometimes it drove them crazy, uh, but there were a lot of occasions where we found people who were just saying, well, I don't have to go to this athletic practice or this recital or these lessons or these different things, that everyone was home. Um, and we found people, you know, asking, well, what do I do? How, what does a family dinner look like? Cause we don't normally have family dinner, you know, or people on Sunday when they, they really, their kids couldn't sit and watch tele televised masses. How do I get them to pray? How do they, you know, I mean, there's all these challenges that forced, I think a lot of good fruit, but I do think that there, um, that the occasions that we've been out with uh, groups of people, we have a, a group by us that, uh, has um, a, a family camp and we've been uh, speaking there and um, people were so happy just to not look at somebody on a Zoom box. They were just ecstatic to come out and be with um, other adults. And uh, so I, I think there's gonna be um, some, some challenges getting some people who were on the fringes before who now no longer see mass and other, maybe the value of, of our faith because it wasn't there in the first place and it maybe was a veneer. I think there's going to be some challenges for us to really reach out and draw them back in. Mm -hmm. um, but at least so far, that there, I see a lot of good fruits uh, as well with uh, families who are making more time for each other. So I think, I think we as a church and as innovators particularly need to think about that transition for families. Because, I mean, depending on the school district, I don't know what the school year is going to look like in the, uh, the fall. Um, some are some day a week, some are trying to go full time, but what if there's another uh, spike and, and government changes uh, some of the rules in the mid, middle of the year. I think we as, as innovators need to think about how can we support those families and the parishes really, because we had a, a number of dioceses reach out to us and, and some parishes because they don't know what to do. They don't know how to serve. And I believe this is the unique place for innovators to think and help the church think through how do we respond to that? I don't have a perfect answer, but I believe uh, the number of works that are going on here are going to be uh, essential for the parish, the diocese that is, is struggling to say, how do I reach these families? How, how do I get those families on the fringe? How do I keep, continue to both evangelize and educate in a way that is, um, that is powerful? So I, I don't know if you, you've seen different things, Kathy, but there are definitely blessings and curses in this, uh, these challenging times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mike. Nancy, did you have another question to follow up to that too? So it's kind of wrapped in. I'm not sure it's really separate, but um, in our ministry, we hear from parents all the time that had uh, that, that don't feel qualified to be primary educators of the faith yeah. because either they had terrible formation themselves or, you know, just aren't living the life they think they should be living. 
Um, and so I, we feel we spend a lot of time creating materials uh, that form kids, but really are meant to be consumed as a family so that they can form parents. Um, and I, I feel like a major struggle that we face is to empower these parents that they can do something that like, even, yeah, even you, even you are called to be the primary educator. And so we, we've come at that all the time. It's kind of our major focus. How do we empower parents? You know, not that primary group that is like, oh, sweet, we get to do everything at home now. You know, I finally going to have time to wash my kids' feet and do <laughs> and all that stuff. Not that group, but the group that's like, oh, crap. Yeah. I have to do CCD myself. So I was just wondering, like, how, I mean, do you have in your mind, how do you reach those parents? Or do yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's a great point. And I think that's the, that's the majority, heavy, healthy majority of, of Catholic parents or, or um, families like that, just feeling unconfident, not confident and, and ill-equipped uh, for the work. Um, I think that most crew, I, I remember there, and, and I'll, I can't remember the title of it, but it was from Notre Dame. So maybe uh, one of the Johns can remind me if, if you've seen this, but there's, a, um, I think it was, uh, it was a Christian Slater that talked about one of the most powerful ways that, is that right? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Might be Professor Christian Smith. Yeah. Christian Smith. Ah, that's right. Of course. I don't know what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Uh, so Christian Smith talked about um, uh, how one of the, the key ways that, um, the faith is transmitted effectively in families is the, the genuine sharing, uh, the conversations that happen. I, I, again, I'm, I'm synthesizing and remembering it from a while, uh, a while ago, just reading this. But the idea that our messy witness, if you will, um, as parents is a powerful, powerful tool um, in evangelizing and catechizing. It's more important that they show up and they do it uh, than that they get it perfectly right. I think there are too many of us that, that have a set a high standard of a Pinterest perfect, what it means to catechize and educate and so forth. It is it, not that we don't need to strive, not that we don't need to be more intentional, but the more that we can make that first, um, uh, remove that first obstacle, um, I believe, for parents so that they know that not only do they have an obligation to do it, it's actually going to be effective. You, you show up and you you are there with your kids and you constantly do better um, at that one thing of just showing up and loving and speaking genuinely about your own faith. Because if they don't have the faith themselves, they can't really effectively share it. I, I, we were just at an event um, and we had a young couple who are fabulous. Uh, they, they, they had so many great things going for them, but they said, you keep talking about us sharing a, about our relationship with God. And I go to mass, but I don't know what you're talking about. I have no idea how to share that. And that's what we need to make sure. We're not simply uh, proposing an intellectual idea or a philosophical uh, worldview for, for our parents. We're presenting and bringing them to a, um, a re an, into a relationship, into an encounter with Jesus Christ. And so if there is a way that we can remove some obstacles to make it a, a, an easier entry level for some of those parents so that they can say, okay, I, my faith might be very simple. My faith may not be where I have all the answers, but my faith is real. And I know this is the path of life and simple sharing um, and making it real so that it's not just a one-time activity, but that they're, they're talking to their kids over the dinner table. They're, they're talking after maybe watching or reading something that they're, they're seeing that their simple witness of life. And, and really that's what, what you at Catholic Sprouts, I think are, you're giving them catechetical tools uh, so that they can teach the faith and have hopefully more confidence. But sometimes we just need to say, look, you showing up for your kids, you being the, the, the more that your kids are secure in their identity as your son or daughter, the more they're going to believe that there's a God who they can't see loves them. And so making those simple kind of like one step forward, baby steps to uh, evangelization for those parents, I think will help them realize that, okay, evangelization isn't a, a far reach above me. I don't need a PhD in uh, a theology uh, to bring my kids into a, a knowledge and a loving relationship with Christ and his church. Um, I don't know if that, that, that speaks to you at all, but I think there is something very powerful about trying to both give them an ideal to strive for, but also making that first rung on the ladder, if you will, very accessible and making it very like, hey, it's okay. 
that you're not going to get it right. We want you to not get it right. We'd rather you do it uh, than, than not do anything at all. I don't know if that helps. Tremendously. I love that idea of a messy witness. Powerful for me, even as a mom. Really. <laughs> Great, thanks, Nancy. Martin had a Martin. You had a couple of questions. Um, do you want to introduce yourself and your project, and and um, ask any questions you like? Sure. Um, hey, thank you so much, uh, Michael, for that really just awesome presentation. I um, uh, it, it was it was so excellent. Um, my name uh, My name is Martin. I'm working on this uh, project called Harbor, uh, which is forming uh, communities of uh, discernment for Catholics nice. uh, live live in communities using a former convent buildings uh, within dioceses. And actually a lot of, I would say like a lot of the reason, um, you know, this is actually happening at all is just because of a lot of really negative experiences. I had, I had a very troubled family growing up and uh, maybe like by me wanting to form these communities, I'm trying to find some kind of healing there or something. I don't know. That's one <laughs> of the things that your, your, your talk kind of made me think, think about. But uh, my, my, my question is, uh, is a bit specific, though. I, I, I remember reading um, an article years ago called Messy Hospitality, and it very well might have been an article written by you. I'm not sure. Um, uh, anyway, the, the, the basic premise was that, you know, a lot of people put up a lot of unnecessary obstacles whenever they have people come over. Uh, you know, they say everything has to be perfect. The house has to be clean. And, and, um, and uh, what, what that does is it sets such a high barrier of entry to have anybody come over. Nobody ever has anybody come over anymore because they're so embarrassed. Yes. Um, and I was wondering if that, is, uh, if that concept is at all related to your, um, the title of your, of your program. Uh, you know, the Messy Family Project, if, if that's, um, yeah, if, if that's related at all. That, that was my question. Yeah, no, uh, 100%, absolutely. And um, I, I don't know for sure, but um, somebody, we, we live here in Steubenville, and uh, Kimberly Hahn was the first one who said that idea to us about messy hospitality eons ago. So it might have been, might have been an article from her. I don't think we wrote that. Um, but, um, but maybe we didn't. I just have a bad memory because, you know, that's just the way it is. But, um, but it is, it, it, it is that, that idea that, you know, uh, Chesterton's, uh, you know, if there's something worth doing, it's worth doing poorly. He doesn't want us to do a bunch of junk out there, but he wants us to get out there, get into the mess of, of things and recognize that each day we're hopefully going to be a little bit better, a little bit better, but don't try to you know, uh, sprint the, the 10, uh, the 10 miles, uh, right away, you know, take, take your, your steps and it's more vital. Um, interesting little, uh, uh, kind of anecdote that I heard recently, there was this, uh, photographer and the, uh, or I, I'm sorry, a professor of photography. And he asked his students, uh, to, um, split his students in half and said, your entire grade will be based on this. The first half of the students, uh, simply is the number of pictures that you take and the second group, um, your entire grade will be based on one photo that you submit. And your entire grade for this class will be based on this. Well, um, as the, the, the uh, semester wore on, the, um, uh, the, those who had the, um, the volume, who just said as many pictures as possible, they got the best grades. Where the person who was taking the one picture, they only needed to get one good picture, um, really were, were bombing out, had awful pictures. And the professor found that it's, um, it's when we try to set the standard as if we only get one perfect picture, we get one thing and we get that one thing right, we're going to fail. But if we simply say it's about showing up, it's about doing, it's about being out and engaged, um, they, they constantly got better. And uh, uh, Jerry Seinfeld would say that he made a commitment that he wanted to be a great comedian. So he said, I'm going to write it one joke a day. And some of the jokes were, he said, were real stinkers, you know, but he, he kept that commitment. And he says, and out of that, he got some great material. And I think both in our family lives, um, as well as in our innovations, we need to be able to say, you know, we got to keep doing it. It's the, it's the business of doing and getting out and loving. Um, I think it was, um, and it, so it's a beautiful thing that you're doing with, with the vocations. And uh, if I could just add, since you didn't ask this question, I'll just, uh, I'll, I'm, a, I'm a former politician, so I'll answer questions that I thought I heard. Um, the idea of being, um, uh, about being the, 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 the vocation is about a gift of self. And the more that they can have not just a time for prayer and discernment, but actual action. Um, I, I think it was uh, Fulton Sheen who said, if you wanted to uh, go out and serve, you know, just 
you know, start loving, start getting out of yourself and you'll see and hear God um, in the ways that you're giving yourself away. So, so Martin, I do think you're probably on some level, I think we all are feeling, um, I don't say wounds, but, 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 but at least for me, it was uh, a wound of my family life that is now being fulfilled by giving myself away in my own family and also in this ministry. So that's awesome. That's great what you're doing. Thank you so much. Martin, did you want to give me other questions you wanted to ask? Yeah, sure. Um, I, um, so I, I, had a, I had a second question. I, I, uh, uh, I'm sorry, if this is out of scope, you know, no, no, no you can just uh, maybe. I'll answer another question. Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> um, so my, my dad is, all, um, is also a recovering alcoholic. And um, I just started talking to my dad after um, 10 years of not talking to him. Yeah. And um, and I'm the oldest of, um, of eight siblings, and I'm trying to lead my siblings to embrace this messiness. I, I, it's like there's a learning opportunity here. It's like it, you're redeemable. Like, right. like my, my, my old way of thinking, it's like I never wanted to talk to my dad again. Yes. But, uh, but I, now it's like, no, we can, we can fix this. Most of my siblings, anyway, I, I, this is, it might be way out of scope, so, so sorry. But I, is, it, how can I, what I want to know is like, how can I help lead my siblings into like taking this risk of, um, of resuming this relationship with their father? Mm, yeah, that's powerful. And that's hard. Um, so I, I'll just share from my own experience. And um, I, so I am on the younger side. Um, and so I, um, again, just out of my own personal story, I didn't have the brunt of some of my, my dad's, uh, anger and all of that as much as my older siblings did. Um, and I've got family members at different places in the faith uh, right now. And I've tried to at different points to really reach in and speak to them both about faith and others. And I've had hit or miss uh, success in that. Um, and uh, for me, it came via my, my own healing, both which included counseling, but also spiritual direction. I had, and I'll just say this, I had, I had trouble praying to the Our Father because that, that was a concept that was foreign uh, and, and didn't make sense. And I didn't want to know a God who was Father based on my own experience. And I don't think I, I could articulate that until, until later, uh, but there were, were priests uh, who really helped me uh, understand who God the Father was in a way that um, really transformed my prayer and really brought healing to me. And I got to a place where I could speak uh, with love and truth uh, with proper boundaries uh, to my dad. And I had to get to a place of wholeness uh, to speak to him, again, not out of bitterness, not out of a victim status, but really being free um, and saying, you know, it really, I really missed that you weren't there for this, this, this. And I wasn't blaming him. I was just kind of, in a way, unburdening my heart. Um, and he took it. And, you know, one of the, the AA attributes is, you know, kind of making amends. He couldn't replace the years that we lost of, of in our family or the, some of the, the, the things that were done. Uh, but he, he was genuine in his apology. And, but he also, um, you know, wasn't perfect. And he still got plenty of challenges. And I had to accept him for who he was and realize that I could still be a father that wasn't like him. And I felt like that was my big hurdle for me personally was, Am I going to end up just like him? Am I going to follow down that that path as he did? And I I struggled with anger, and uh, dealing with that with my own kids and all of that. Anyway, so I, I say all that is that the only person you can control, the only person you can lead, is you and and your own immediate um, family. Now your your siblings, um, it, it's really their own call. And the the first encouragement I would have for you is to really think about um, your own health wholeness. Because that witness is more palpable, more um, more valuable than any words you could ever uh, share. Um, and then, secondly, is is understanding your own boundaries. Um, if you're not familiar with Dr. Henry Cloud, he's got some great books, and this is others as well. Um, yeah, okay. Um, and uh, getting to a place where you know, hey, I'm not going to tell them what to do. I'm not going to force them what to do. But I do have a place. I have a responsibility. I have an influence in their lives. And if I can do this from a place of health and wholeness um, and, and real um, desire for love and forgiveness. Because really that's, that's our job as Christians is, is to forgive. That doesn't mean we're supposed to like everybody. It doesn't mean we're supposed to be in relationship with everybody uh, or be intimate and, and, and vulnerable with everybody. But our family, I believe, is, is a way that we can and ought to 
uh, exert some influence. That influence, though, has to be done without coercion, without you know any kind of expectations that everyone's going to follow that path. Everyone's got a different way to process this. Um, but I do think that you can, and, and I've done simple things, right? Um, and I just invited all the family together. Uh, we're, they're almost all back in New York and I'm out here in Ohio. So when I come, I try to get, make an occasion where we can all get together. And, uh, and we're all, uh, you know, Catholic, at least in some level of practice. And so one or two times I'm like, Hey, let's pray together. And my dad would join us and, you know, all of this. And so I don't know what is going to be that, uh, you know, we, we would just go to someone's house and have pool, like just keeping it, keeping again, that, that idea of the threshold being um, a, a small threshold in the beginning, what would be that first step? Keep it super simple. Let's, let's all just be in the same room together. Maybe we can come for some occasion and it's not focused on maybe repairing the relationship as beginning again. And hey, we had some fun time. We had a pool party. Nobody had any, you know, major blowouts. And this was a good first step. I, you know, I don't know what the relationships look like, but um, I think the slow, but but taking small, modest steps and really listening to the Holy Spirit because it, it is a. I believe our family again is a vocational call, and much like, you know, you're discerning that you're you're trying to help serve and and allow your siblings to experience healing. Hopefully, that you have. And that's what you want for them is life, life into the full. So I don't know if that's, that's some thoughts at least. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Martin, for having the courage to, to ask that question. It's very admirable. Um, a couple other questions in here. Uh, Paul, you had a question. Um, you want to introduce yourself? and Sure. Your question? Thanks. Hey, Mike. Uh, well, I'm in the throes of messy family. I just arrived in Myrtle Beach with a seven-month-old screaming the whole way from Augusta. Awesome. So, um, but that is exactly to my question. How do you make the leap of hobby ministry to support 10 kids ministry? Yes. yes. Never has that seemed more scary with my six kids and my wife in the car on the way to Myrtle Beach. Yes. And so, Paul, if you don't mind me asking, are you in ministry or are you in the hobby phase where, where are you at okay so uh mike is on the call i think lorena and father josh may not be on the call we're doing pastoral parish which is focuses on pastoral care and sacramental preparation for uh parishes yes um so i own a marketing firm but i'm trying to make the leap out of that in the pastoral parish um so that goes from one uncertainty to another you know? <laughs> Gotcha. Um, and is that your desire? Where we're at. And, yes, and your desire would so. you? Okay. Okay. Very much so. Um, and, and with six kids, and, and you said your youngest is seven months. Is that what I heard? Correct. 12 okay. years old to seven months. Wow. Wow. Yeah. One, that's crazy and awesome. Thank you for, uh, for your decision for life and uh, for a crazy, messy family and for traveling uh, with those kids. So uh, God bless you for surviving the trip. Um, so, so for us, again, I, I don't want to say that there's one path for everybody, but, um, for, uh, when I went into, to politics, um, and I think it sounds like you're already in this space, but when I went into politics, I really felt called into it, but I, I thought it was be, it would be an aberration of my responsibilities as a father, as a provider. Um, I saw everything in politics as a den of thieves and the, 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 the scum of the earth, if you will, and all this, this stuff. And I just thought all these broken marriages and all this, this, this disconnected family life. And I'm like, I don't want to do this, but I felt like God was calling me into it. And, uh, I was, you know, really challenged by the, the, uh, by a number of different things, but, but in doing that, I found that it gave me life, um, in our marriage. It gave us life mm -hmm. in, um, in the way that I parented, in the way that I helped form. But the, the challenges, like, so I, um, my first job was actually in Washington, D.C., and I was commuting, um, and it was, it was murder on my, uh, my commute, commuting from Ohio to Washington, D.C. for work, okay? That's, it's, it wow. Was, and it was two years that I know there was a specific and unique grace for. And at the end of that two years, we were done. My wife and I were done. She was at our end of her, her rope. We decided it together. Um, so so I, the first principle, though, that is, uh, is important is that 
it needs to be the two of you, you and your spouse, because this is not something that is, I know you know this, but I'm going to say this because um, the, the job that, that they wanted me in Washington, D.C., they wanted me to move. They wanted, you know, there are all these things. And I just, I turned down the job. I thought it was the exact perfect job for me, but I turned it down three times because they only were going to require me to be physically there so that I could be 24 seven. And I said, yeah. I just, I can't do that. And, um, and I ended up with uh, four days a week and they were long, intense days. Um, and, uh, but I was able to have very, every weekend was a long weekend. We kind of negotiated that and we, we knew going into it, it would still be rough, but I, I was able to, you know, I had very long days when I was in DC anyway. Um, uh, but, but getting, getting to a place where you and your spouse are on the same page doesn't mean that you start there and, and that that's the end of it. Because what I found is that as I, um, as I did that, I, um, I was always caught up in my work. I was always caught up in the good work. It was pro-life. It was serving the greater cause. It was all these things. And I was disconnecting from my wife and I didn't realize it. And my wife called me on it and, uh, it didn't change right, right away, but it really, uh, it was an eye opener that even if you're following God, it doesn't make it easier. It doesn't mean that there are things that are just going to be uh, tearing at who you are and who the things that you know are really important. doesn't mean that those won't be threatened. And I can guarantee you that will be the same thing, whether you're in ministry or in secular work or anything. you will have challenges heaped upon you that will try to d divide and, and pull you apart. But first starting with that and knowing what is it going to take for us to make sure we're maintaining our marriage and our family life to a level that is vital, that is, that is important for us. So before even the job, recognizing if this doesn't bring life to your marriage and your family life, then don't do it because it's not of God. That's an easy discernment in my book. Yeah. Um, and, but knowing what that looks like, meaning both from a, you know, again, I, th I think you were asking more to like, how do you do this financially? How do you make this leap? Um, and knowing that you had those first things in place, um, I have found, um, you know, I'm, I'm, we've got 26 years of marriage under our belt, 10 kids. We have three, actually two of our kids are, are married and we now have uh, three grandchildren. So we've, we've weathered some storms up and down. And, uh, I've also started, um, more than one, uh, apostolate before, uh, one continues on one was a epic failure or it lasted for a year and a half. Um, so I, I know the challenges of living on our own. It sounds like you have your own business. So you know what that means providing, uh, you don't, you're yeah. not on a paycheck. It sounds like, am I right on that? that is, oh, absolutely correct. And, so, uh, and I have a staff in the marketing firm and which is interesting because I guess I was hyper naive seven years ago when I started, when I left Comcast, I was ad sales or Comcast Yes. and I went out on my own. So I guess maybe now that I'm not so naive, it yeah. seems like a even more of a daunting jump to go yes. from something I know that is still uncertain because I, I make my own paycheck to absolutely and, and, and also, your own paycheck. Yeah, and, and I, so yeah, so I I I am so thankful I don't live for a paycheck today. You know, I, I'm thankful to be on our own. There is such joy in this, but COVID hit and we had some major financial challenges. Right, that that we had some small monthly donors, some larger donors that, that, that walked away. And I, I, I use that as an opportunity to say, God, is this really what you wanted for me? <laughs> Go back to that paycheck. And with, with, I have, I'll have three in college this fall. And I'm like, wow. God, what are you doing? What is going on? And I said, but that, that it was really, for me, it, it comes down to, if this is what God wants, then it's going to work. And I've got to work my tail off, but, but he's going to provide. And I said, I made the commitment. I said, God, I, I know you want to be in this. So I'm going to, I'm going to hustle. I'm going to work. And uh, somebody who I had approached before two years ago, I reapproached who said, no, uh, said I'm in this time. And it, it from a benefactor standpoint. And, and for me, um, I had been prepared for this. I don't think this is for the faint of heart and those who don't necessarily have the, uh, both the experience of living on our owns, if you will, but also having, because uh, I assume you'd be living on, on fundraising on some level. Is that right? Um, Whereas your well, ministry. Well, ours is, ours is a, a subscription service. So okay. yeah. And, and we so, get so the, if we get the flywheel moving, it'll um, support pretty well. Okay. And, and, and so 
knowing that it, it, it has to be run like a smart business, you know, like mm -hmm. you have great experience running your own business for seven years. Don't think that you enter the apostolate world and somehow the, the economic system changes or that, you know, all Gracious the business no. truths, right. You know, and too many within the church treat it as if uh, that is the case, you know, that there is some kind of new economic system within the church. Of course, we have found providentially things that have happened that we could not have planned or foreseen. And I believe there is an anointing on uh, families and on, on apostolates to do uh, what God has called you to. Uh, but there is a level of risk. I would be happy to go further into this to share our own story. I'm, I'm just looking at the time here. But I think that the crucial thing, Paul, in, in discerning this is the unity with your spouse uh, figure out what your comfort level is. I mean, you're obviously already somebody who has a, a tolerance for risk by having your own business. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> you know, but, but what does that tolerance look like uh, in the apostolate? And, uh, and, and, and build your life as if God was really in charge, meaning what would he want for you and your family and for this apostolate? And set that as a standard and, and almost create that as a marker and say, God, I'm not that you're, you're playing uh, – uh, betting against God or anything like that, but say, Hey Lord, these are the standards I have Change my heart if I'm wrong, but here are the simple criteria that I think this will be a sign for me that you're ready for me to take the leap. It will still be a leap of faith. It will still be a risk, but what is it that you need to put your heart at peace, to put your wife's heart at peace so that you are ready to take that next step? Because sometimes those ministries don't grow unless you're really w willing and able to take those risks. But if they're mm -hmm. not wise, uh, then, then you're following your own ambitions. And when you put it out there and you have a, a, a deeper reliance upon God, um, I believe those are good places. And, and something a spiritual director told me once that I, I really live for uh, is that God loves us too much to call us to things that we can accomplish on our own. God loves us too much to call us to things that we can do on our own. He wants us to, to rely on him and on others to be a part of that. So that's, uh, that's my thoughts. But I, again, happy to talk to you more in the future if that's Eddie. Yeah, let me survive this week of vacation and uh, I'd love to connect later. Sounds great, Paul. God bless you. God bless you too. All right. Well, thanks, Paul. Thanks, Mike, for, for that discussion. And we're, uh, there's some more questions in the, in the chat, but I um, want to respect the, the time here. Do you have any final one? I'll just kind of paraphrase a question from, from Karina at my prayer corner. They're developing um, – prayer kits for, uh, for families in the home. So very related to your mission, but, um, you know, just any last final thoughts on how to balance or integrate, um, family life with, uh, just having tons of work to do. Just family thinking. life and tons of work to do. Yeah. yeah I well, I, I, I'm going to make an assumption here and I might be wrong. I, I know there's some people from dioceses, but there's, I'd say are a lot of the, a lot of the folks on the call in their own ministry work for themselves. Is that right? We right? full time are starting that and beginning that path. Yeah. Okay. So uh, one of the things that I have seen and that we need to be uh, very conscious of is that our work will be fruitless if we don't put first things first. And I think that it comes back to um, reorienting our priorities. Um, and I, I was just just uh, taking some time in, in a retreat uh, just recently and thinking about you know I'm first a son of God. Well, what does that mean? Both body, mind, and spirit for myself. Um, and then I am a husband uh, before I am a father, and then I'm a ministry leader. I kind of mentioned that before, but the more that we can recognize that um, the work we're about is God's work, it's not ours. And the more that we can invest in those things, uh, if we can't get, we shouldn't be in ministry if we, we don't have some of those things figured out because our ministries will fail. They'll consume us and take us apart. Uh, but the more that we uh, place our time and, and we show it by the way we uh, schedule our day, the way we spend our money. This is where our, the rubber hits the road. Do we really value the fact that I, I need prayer? Um, do we make an appointment with God, so to speak, you know, and really have that as a, a, a wall around it? Because when we are busy uh, with the apostolate, we forget the soul of the apostolate, which is prayer. And then moving out from that identity, uh, that is crucial uh, for us to really be effective. Because if the Holy Spirit uh, is the, uh, the means of evangelization is the means of our work. If we don't have that first, everything else will be fruitless and um, we will uh, fall apart. Um, and the devil will distract us. The devil will, um, you know, doesn't need to destroy us. He just needs to distract us. And too quickly, uh, we become busy with the things uh, of our work and forget that the foundation of that is our prayer, 
our relationship and our marriage and our family. And out of that comes our sharing of life in our ministry. If that's good. Very helpful. Great. Well, thank you, Mike. Thank you so much again for, for being here and sharing this with us. And um, uh, really grateful for all the work you're doing. We'll keep you and your wife uh, and, and her uncle in prayer as well. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you guys. It's a really a pleasure to be with you. Again, if I can be helpful to any of you, uh, feel free to, to reach out. I'd love to stay connected in any way possible. Thank you so much. All right. Thank God you bless. So much. Great job, Mike. Thanks so much. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you all.